obtain some discipline uh, in both the sessions. Both the moderators uh, uh, will uh, take questions one by one. You can raise your hands uh, and ask the question. Uh, so we'll begin with the book discussion, uh, the book called Bharat, which was written by Professor Desi Raju. And I would like to invite <coughs> Sri Shrobit Mathurji <coughs> on stage and uh, request him to formally introduce Professor Desi Raju to our students. And before that, I would like to introduce Shobit ji to all of you. We all know them but uh, right now we have a huge lot of students who have recently joined us. Uh, so a brief uh, profile of uh, uh, Shobit ji. Uh, Shobhi ji did his B.Tech uh, from IIT Bombay in 2005 in Computer Science. Then he uh, did his MS from University of Washington. He joined Amazon and worked in Seattle for almost five years. And there he realized that he wanted to do something for his country. He quit his job. He came back to India. And when he landed up here, he started an organization called Youth for Seva. So the idea was to connect the youth of India uh, towards nation building activities. So that way he actually uh, sacrificed a lot of his uh, career in connecting the youth of India. And then uh, along with our uh, founder, uh, CEO, Sri Sahil Agarwal ji, he uh, founded Vision India Foundation uh, and uh, connected almost uh, more than 2,000 youngsters through their uh, short duration certificate programs. And then uh, in that journey, he uh, joined ISB, Hyderabad, and he did his MBA from there, but he actually refused to take the placement. And that way he started Vision India Foundation. And uh, after uh, doing uh, short courses in seven years, he, re he realized the gap in the Indian Academia and he uh, thought of uh, establishing an academic institute. And there the journey of Rashtram begins, the Vision India Foundation transformed into Rashtram School of Public Leadership. And very recently, uh, the entire team took the decision of transforming Rashtram into a university. And now we have Rishihud University. And we know the history. So uh, I would like to request Shobhiji to come over stage uh, and introduce uh, Professor Desi Raju. And it's an apt moment that he is taking the interview on the book, which is named Bharat. So please, Shobhiji. Uh, over to you. Uh, Nilab, I'll give you the heads up, then you can actually live stream the session. And after this book discussion, we have to take a pause for 10 minutes. There you can stop the live streaming. Then we'll continue with the next session. Uh, Dr. Gautam Desi Raju, to all of you. Dr. Desi Raju was born in <coughs> 1952. That's five years post we received our independence, or we got our independence in Chennai, and is presently an honorary professor at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He is a recipient of several prestigious international awards and was president of the International Union of Crystallography between 2011 and 2014. He is acknowledged as a world thought leader who set up this whole stream of crystal engineering. He is second highly cited Indian scientist today with uh, 450 research papers, 64,000 plus citations and an H index, some of you who are aware of it, of more than 100. So that's like top eminent scientist, not just within India, globally. Okay. He is with us today to discuss this recent book that he's written, Bharat India 2.0. Uh, the book believes and the, his core message is that uh, the issues that India is facing today is primarily because we have chosen an unsuitable form of governance uh, that does not factor India's essential civilizational nature. So it's, he goes to the root of the problem saying it is actually the very model of governance that we have chosen and the root of that is actually in the constitution, right? And he's suggesting reforms so that we can uh, revitalize India. That's the topic of the session today as well. That is the prime. Interestingly, such topics are written in a very esoteric manner. So he's written it for the very young audience because the way he looks at is, He's taught for four decades, and he's always been interfacing with young people. So he thinks them as the first audience for his book, and that's how he's written it. I have read the book, uh, and that's how I have prepared for this discussion. 
and i should say it is perhaps a very unique book that i have seen in more recent times it's very very thought provoking it's very very influential it is very provocative it makes you think very strongly he's he gives very radical suggestions towards the end which definitely need to be deliberated um and um, most importantly touches on a topic of the indian constitution which many of us being close to delhi and the people in delhi assume to be sacrosanct right there's something called constitutional morality so co constitution is very sacrosanct don't talk about it it is what has been given to us by our founders but he is questioning that and that is something i would encourage all of you to pay attention to because that through that is what uh, the rest of the book flows and he's identified that as a very key issue thank you dr desiraju for joining us and uh, let's uh, have a very interesting um, because for me meeting a chemist after a long time personally my interest in engineering and all that but of all the engineering subjects when i was preparing for iit chemistry has been my most interesting subject quite unlike but then you know what it is as a j rank besides you already know the picking order you go into computer science but chemistry was always very interesting for me so you're a structural chemist by training and uh, but you have chosen to write a book on the indian constitution so it is challenging in two ways i would say one first of all uh, how do you develop scholarship for something like this at the same time coming from hard sciences something into more of social sciences that's also a switch because there it is very evidence based data centric in many ways here it is many things are very subjective so in both ways how did you develop a scholarship like this and how did you choose and how did you write a book on a subject very different from your core stream yeah uh, thank you <clears throat> dr mathur for the question and also for <clears throat> requesting me to have this book discussion of course you know students i am a member of your academic council now so <clears throat> i would also be giving will affect you people during your time in rishihod you know dr mathur asks <clears throat> about this you know so called switch that i seem to have made in my professional activities and uh, could hold a bit closer i and uh, not really a switch in that sense as i've written in the preface and this is the nice thing about research when you're able to do research properly in any one discipline you can more or less easily do research in what seems to be an entirely different discipline and uh, i'm told some of these pop musicians also start changing the kind of music they are singing in i don't know what the technical term is but there are some of these people who have started singing in a different genre or playing music in another genre at some stage i don't know what exactly triggers the thing and i was always fond of history i knew very little about the indian constitution 2 years ago as he says correctly it seems to be some delhi centric thing some supreme court judges talking something now and then and uh, it didn't really seem to touch me i to be serious i never thought about it and if you say constitution maybe i thought ambedkar or something like that i i knew no more about it i was reading quite a lot about history i've always been interested in history especially uh, wars and my two favorite books in this context are the mahabharat and mm, the history of the second world war so i feel that between these two books the entire gamut of human emotions is more or less covered there is nothing much you need to learn after you read about these two things 
And in the book also I have written uh, that the theme of the book is India did not start this war, but Bharat will finish it. Uh, that's the theme of the book. And the book is a justification. The earlier part of the book, the first two chapters, will justify the first part of this statement, India did not start this war. The third chapter, which is the shortest chapter in the book, is in some ways the most important, I think. Because I feel that this is what our constitution did not encapsulate. That we are that we are actually a civilizational state. So what is a civilizational state? And the fourth and fifth chapter will justify the second part of the theme, but Bharat will finish it. How will we finish it? You ask about science, your original question was how did a scientist I have analyzed this whole subject from the viewpoint of a scientist. Many of my science friends who have read the book have told me, Professor Desi Raju, only a scientist could have written a book like this. A gentleman by the name of uh, Abhishek Banerjee, he is a mathematics professor in my institute in Bangalore. He wrote a very nice review of the book in India today. And uh, Bhavesh Kansara, who is a similarly an engineering background and now is an entrepreneur, actually an industrialist in Chennai. He wrote a lovely review in Sunday Guardian, I think two weeks ago. Both these people have said that it is a scientist's approach to the problem. And in fact, Bhavesh says, that uh, scientists often tend to simplify things where social scientists tend to complicate them. And as a scientist, let me tell you, almost all of you are not studying in the scientific disciplines. But the most important thing for a scientist to do is to propose a solution to a problem. So we analyze a problem we look at it and we are not happy with just stating the problem. We always propose a solution. And I think this is what distinguishes us from other people. It does not matter to us in the least whether that solution will ultimately be correct or wrong. But the important thing is to propose a solution because novel that you're bringing to this whole thing. And then you see you work backwards. This is the other thing. Most people who are not scientists but are in the research line and thinking people, use what is called deductive logic. So A causes B to happen, B causes C to happen, etc., etc. This is, they are comfortable doing that. Scientists, serious ones anyway, use the reverse, the inductive logic. So for example, if a situation called C exists, then it must have come from B. And if a situation then means that B is there, B must have come from A. So usually scientists look at the present and go to the past. Social scientists look at the past and try to derive the present. And so with this kind of inductive thinking, you see proposing a solution becomes very easy. And that's the way we scientists are actually wired. So it's nothing unusual, I think, Mr. VC, for
for a scientist to write a book like this and in the end at a more emotional level this constitution of india is also my constitution i am an indian who has lived 64 of his 70 years in india all this h index of 100 and 100 plus and all it was all done for work done in india it was not done anywhere else so this is my country this is my constitution it does not belong to chandrachud it is not his personal property and this is what is important for all you young people to know because you are the young india you are the real india this book is dedicated to you i have written that it is dedicated to all the young people of india 2.0 and it is written for you guys people in my age group or even in vc's age group can read it and enjoy but it is for you to conduct the experiment that i have described i will again talk in a scientist language so you see there is no dichotomy here in a scientist writing about the constitution it's my constitution it's his constitution it's your constitution as individuals not as a group and that is where the civilizational thing becomes important because a civilization is only made when an individual feels certain things very strongly and very deeply and everybody else around him or her is feeling like that so that then there is a synergy that is how civilizations come up so it's a rather long answer to a short question how did a scientist write a book like this i find nothing unusual that i wrote a book like this yes there were certain things that helped the covid lockdown prevented me from going to the institute to my lab and students so i had to sit at home so i had to do something and i don't have a lab in my house so i this is the new experiment that i tried yeah thank you for sharing that i think a very significant point for all of us here is that it is our constitution right very often we think somebody else out there is writing something for us and it doesn't matter to us but you have really taken it to heart and said if this is our constitution why did it come in the way it is what is the history behind it and uh, you went back all the way probably the root cause of how this constitution came up and interestingly also proposing a solution which i have not seen otherwise usually we are good at pointing out problems but not actually suggesting reforms to make changes and you have done that um another very provocative thought that you have um, mentioned in the book is that the word india does not describe us very well right we all we have been using the word india we are indians it's an indian constitution but you still say that the word india doesn't describe us very well and i quote from the book um, uh, you say that uh, india may be a sufficient descriptor of us as a country partial descriptor as a nation and completely inadequate descriptor as a civilization so can you explain first of all you have used different words like country nation and civilization and why india is completely insufficient to explain it yes it's an important question that you ask country nation civilization don't mean the same thing country is a political construction the country means it is some they got some geographical boundaries you know that separates a country from the next country people the government of a country country is a sovereign thing and the government of that country is allowed to issue passports in the name of those people who are citizens of that country country is allowed to issue some currency notes which will become legal tender within that country so it is a sign of sovereign authority it's a legal it's a technical thing actually you can give up your passport and take up the passport of some other country the idea of country exists because other things that are countries recognize you as a country 
That's all. I can't say that I'm going having a country called Sonipat because nobody will recognize you as a country. All the other countries have to recognize the Sonipat country, which won't happen. So that is country. Country is the simplest one of the three. And uh, most people, 99.9% .9 of the people, have no problem in defining their country identity. So if you say, what is your country, you will say India and you will be correct. Now this nation idea is a little more subtle. When you see Tiranga or when you hear Janaganamana, you feel something nice, no, suddenly. It's some sort of some emotional feeling that you get, small. It happens to each of us all the time. These things don't, cannot leave you untouched. This morning I went for a small walk in that uh, small road on that, near the fields outside your campus. There's a shanty town and there are two national flags, small things flying on top of the shanty. I don't know, I just felt good seeing the flag, that's all. There's nothing, no special, no chief minister, prime minister coming and unfurling it and all. Somebody. He literally, the slum, he has put a national flag outside his. Just felt good, that's all. It's that for That emotional thing, when you start feeling, you don't feel it for your country, you feel it for your nation. That's the difference between country and nation. Nation is best defined by Ambedkar, and I've given the quotation. He said, nation means there's some sort of feeling of belonging to some group. You feel so strongly that you are part of that group. It crosses all economic indicators, social indicators. All other things are bypassed. You just feel part of that group. And remember, the definition of nation is exclusivist. It is not inclusivist. You feel part of your group. And you want to exclude anyone who is not part of that group. That is nation. And also remember, country and nation don't have to be the same. I can have something called Canada nation. I can belong to this Canada nation. Whether I live in Bangalore or Toronto or Sydney. Because certain things I will emote with other people who speak Kannada. Just now I was speaking to your VC, I knew he came from Hyderabad. So we spoke a few sentences to each other in Telugu. So in that sense, for that brief moment, both of us felt we belong to a Telugu nation. That's all. So nations don't always have to correspond to countries. When they do correspond to a country, when nation and country correspond, you get what is called a nation state. Because then the nation becomes a seat of sovereign authority. And this is where chapter 3 comes in important. And my extensive reading of European history and my love of history helped me there. Because Europe is the laboratory, living laboratory for nation state. So they have been experimenting with this idea of nation state for about 400 years in Europe. It's a correspondingly recent addition in the political history of the rest of the world. We have some real nation states like Serbia, Croatia and all that. And then we have some artificial imposed nation states like Pakistan, which were actually created by the West and dumped over there like that. So we have two types of nation states also, which I have described in the book. India and now more accurately Bharat. This is where the word India fails me completely. Bharat is a civilizational state. Civilizational state means is something entirely different. In the Constituent Assembly debates, 
Radha Krishnan describes what a civilization is. He says, a civilization, people belonging to a certain civilization, they make their own subjective interpretation of the life condition itself. See these, see the weight of these words at an individual level. I am trying to give my individual interpretation of the life condition itself. That is civilization. There are only two important civilizational states in the world. One is Bharat and one is China. There is a third one which is trying to become a civilizational state and that is Russia. Trying. Still getting there but maybe it's reached 25% of the way. If you read the things that Dugin writes for example. He sort of thing. What is the civilization state? Civilizational state, we say that Bharata Kande, Bharata Varshe, Jambu Dvipe. Simple invocations in the house for familiar ceremonies begin with these words. What is this Bharata Varsha? It is everything between the ocean and the mountains. Where the children of Bharata live on this lovely island with jambu trees. It's a poetic description. So this civilizational state, Bharata Varsha, existed from say, Gandhara to Mandalay, Indonesia, Bali, Singapore, all that. From Kanyakumari up to the Sumeru mountains, which are now called Pamir. This was Bharata Varsha and all the happy people who lived here had their own wonderful way of living, which was completely integrated in all ways, sciences, arts, humanities, you name it, culture, everything, we were a perfect system, which I call a complex system. I don't have time to get into that today, the difference between a complex system and a complicated system. Read my chapter 5 to understand that part. But this was the system, the civilizational state called Bharat, they make a loose reference to it in the constitution. They say India, that is Bharat. After that, in the rest of that 396 articles, I didn't see Bharat ever again. And that was my objection to the constitution. Our essential nature is a civilizational state. And the underpinning of this civilizational state is dharma. Dharma teaches you what is right and what is wrong. It doesn't teach you what is correct and what is incorrect. It is not that judgmental. What is right, what is wrong. This is the land of Dharma. This is the only place where Dharma was defined in such a nice way. Through our scriptures and holy books. Which incidentally you young people should start reading. This is what is called Sanatana Dharma, the endless Dharma. I like that name. I don't like this word Hinduism. Hinduism, Hindu existed from Sindhu, which is a Persian origin word. Hindustan, all that existed. But this ism kaha se agaya? Hinduism. That ism is only a British Western idea. How can it be ism? It has, it recognizes atheism. It recognizes Sanatan Dharma. It recognizes monism, that is just Brahman, who is without definition. Then it defines, it accepts monotheism. It affects polytheism, it accepts. It accepts animism. All these isms it accepts. How can it be an ism itself? Ism is a matter of opinion. Sanatan Dharma is not a matter of opinion. It is the way you are. I have quoted Sri Aurobindo in the book where he says it's this concept of rights itself is a western concept. Right to do this, right to jump around, right to wear a bikini and go somewhere, right not to wear a bikini. See, 
the concept of rights itself doesn't exist in Sanatana Dharma because it's associated with duties. Duties and rights are just two sides of the same coin in Sanatana Dharma. And Aurobindo says that very specifically. So it is these things which I found that are missing in our constitution. We need a dharmic underpinning of all our activities. Please mark my words carefully. I am not asking for a theocratic state. I am not asking for a theocracy. The other day when the Queen died in England, the funeral was conducted according to the Anglican ceremony. That is Anglican Rashtra. It's a very tolerant society and has people of many religions living there. They didn't have a mullah, they didn't have a Sikh, they didn't have a Hindu pujari. Those people did not come to Westminster Abbey and officiate. So there's no point saying, oh, you guys, you're so intolerant. You never called that imam. That is different, this is different. It is this kind of underpinning of by dharma, not the Anglican doctrines, which is what I am asking for in this book. So when you say in your question, why do you feel that this thing is going the way it's going or why it's not going the way it's going? I think this is essentially what I would like to say. But more you should get by buying the book and reading it. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Desi Raju, for explaining us the difference between a country, a nation, a civilization, and how as we progress, uh, somehow India is insufficient as a word to explain because this feeling of oneness, this feeling of having our own explanation for why we are here comes closer to the word Bharat. Right? Um, so now coming to the um, one of the most significant contributions of the book that I feel uh, and you have put a lot of painstaking effort in making that happen is you feel India should be divided into 75 states. Um, 29 is too less and probably others who have proposed 750 is too high. Somehow you have come to a number like 75 and you have put up a map as well in the book. Those who purchase the book can have a look at it. But um, why this particular number 75? What was the criteria to come up with this 75 states? If you could explain that to our audience, yeah. Certainly. As I said, this is a scientist's solution. Whatever I've said so far, I think you can read from many other authors and commentators from books, and you could get it from your own reading of the constitutional debates. It didn't require me to tell you all this. The solution I proposed, the 75 states for Bharat, comes from the fact that any country that became rich and successful at various times in history, whether it is England or Germany or USA, they took, took the strongest point and then they highlighted it. Right? Our strongest point in this country is diversity. We are a very diverse lot. We revel in this diversity. You know, people start shouting and arguing whether Apus is better or Banganpalli is better or Langada is better. Everyone is correct, everyone is no problem. And yet, when you ask all these three fellows, this Apus fellow and Banganpalli and Langada, whether they are all Indians, they'll say, of course we are all Indians. No, nobody, nobody says anything else. This diversity is not captured. It is approximately they tried to do something by dividing into the states. Don't forget that the states, what we inherited in 47 was a crazy patchwork quilt. We had British India that was directly ruled by the Brits. And don't forget that you people right here in Sonipat are in the extreme corner of what was a huge British state called Punjab. One of the biggest states and you are at the very tail end of it over here. So then we had all these princely states all over, scattered everywhere, left and right. 
And it was not very clear to the people who inherited this whole mess from the British as to what was going to happen to this and that. And so we had people like Sardar Patel who came in and homogenized all this a little bit. Everybody knew that the division of those states as given by the British and the princely states was not going to be a permanent one. So we had certain things called state reorganizations. The most important one of which was in 1956. And then we had a very good one in 1966 for this part of the country where what was called undivided East Punjab because West Punjab went to the other side. So the undivided East Punjab was further divided into Punjab Haryana and Himachal Pradesh. And I have called in the book that that division was so good that uh, Punjab and Himachal I have left untouched. And Haryana I have made some small modifications for reasons that I have described. A noted commentator from Haryana, one D.R. Choudhury, has said that Haryana is an example of a diffused identity. He says this place has no identity at all. And he says, don't judge Haryana by the malls of Panchkula and Gurgaon. That is not Haryana. And so there is something of specific local interest for you in this book. I've actually described each of the 75 states because I felt that once I'm dividing it, I better say something about each of them. You will like this part. My state number one is Gilgit and my state number two is Baltistan. So these, I am pretty sure, confident that these are all going to come back to us, not because we take them over by armed conflict, but they themselves will want to come to us. I am pretty sure about that. And we should welcome them, because that's what a civilizational state is all about. If somebody feels, and, and this brings me to the second point, how did I divide all this? I took a bit of history. I took geography. Certainly, I created this new state of uh, Bagelkhand using bits of UP and bits of MP because both were hilly regions and quite distinct from the plains regions of UP. UP is anyway too big. It's monstrously big and everybody has been asking about division of UP. Uh, simply for administrative reasons, forget everything else. I have made a small state called Doab, which is between Kannauj and Prayagraj, between the Yanga, Ganga and the Yamuna. That Doab state, if it is created, will have a population which is the 35th in the whole world. So about 180 countries will have a population less than Doab, if any, even if you make my small state. So you see, administratively, there's no question they have to be divided into smaller bits. But Abhishek Banerjee talks about this nicely in his review. He says that I have made four, four things I have brought out in the 75 states division. First is diversity optimization. To bring out the true diversity, language might have been an okay thing in the beginning. But all Hindi speaking states were not one state. Even UP was divided into UP and Uttarakhand. The biggest evidence, I'm talking as a scientist, that language is not a good indicator of anything, might have been at some time past. The first state that was divided on the basis of linguistics, namely Andhra Pradesh, was the first non-Hindi speaking state to be divided. Both of us have lived in Telangana. So we know how different it is from coastal Andhra. It's, it's like a different planet altogether. So why they delayed so long to make Telangana, I don't know. So these, these are all things that are crying out. And I have also asked for a third state called Rayal Seema. And if you know Telugu a bit, you will realize, <laughs> yeah, you're laughing, so you know what I mean. <laughs> the guy has to speak for just <laughs> 30 seconds. You will know whether he's from Rayal Seema or coastal Andhra or Telangana. It's, it's not, it's not a, it's a no-brainer. So when the differences are there, let the differences bloom, okay? So that is diversity. Administrative convenience. Mental decolonization. We have been speaking yesterday and today, ever since I came of the slavish mentality towards the West, towards English, a language that I'm forced to speak to you in, because we don't 
share a common Indian language with enough fluency that I can speak to it, you in that. So all these are things that we have to come out of. And by enhancing your diversity, one of the things we talked about NEP, naturally, the new education policy, and what language we are going to teach students. You are students today. You are going to be the teachers of five years from now. In what language would you like to teach your students? I hope it's not English. Because I have traveled to about 40 countries in the world, very all sorts of crazy places. Each one of them, most of them non-English speaking, all the basic level, even research at PhD level, is done in the local language. Especially Japan, I think of Japan and China, Russia. Everything is done in the local language. When they come and talk to foreigners, they'll speak in English. Bus. We must get there. Somehow we must get there. And if we have local languages, many of these education problems will get solved. So if you go to Coimbatore, everybody will be taught in Tamil for the first two or three years. If you come to Bangalore, it will be Kannada. Or whatever it is. If it is in Sonipat, it will be in Hindi. So there's no problem. And your imaginative powers will increase. When you think of imaginative powers, let me give you a small... You do an experiment. Suppose you are deep asleep in the middle of the night and suddenly somebody comes and pokes, pokes you and wakes you up. In what language do you shout out? That is the language in which you should be taught, you should teach, that you should emote. That language. That, that, is, that is your true determinant. That is your identity. So that is that. That is mental decolonization. And last and not the least is the economic leveraging. I gave a similar book launch in Srinagar three weeks back, which was presided kindly by the Lieutenant Governor Manoj Sinhaji. And after the, my little lecture, he said, yes, you are right, Professor Desi Raju. The main thing here is the economic thing. Why does 75 states help economy? Apart from all this diversity, administration, decolonization, mental, physical, metaphysical, all that you leave it. Hardcore money. I give the example of my three Ks. Three K states in three parts of the country, Kashmir, Kutch and Kongu. You go to Kashmir, I've traveled to the valley very many times. Lavender grows wild everywhere. Roses grow practically wild. Little bit of care, but they grow. There is a product called lavender oil, rose oil and so on, which are used in perfumery industries. They are making them in Kashmir using some country methods. Okay, it is hardly competitive in any sense. Bulgaria is the world leader for rose oil and lavender oil. They have made it into a fine art, proper modern industry. If you have a small state called Kashmir, without Jammu or anything, and you tell them you can have your little government and all that, but your main business is to do this rose oil and lavender oil. That Kashmir can beat Bulgaria economically. Similarly, go to Kutch. Kutch has got a large land area, nobody lives there, hardly. It's got a lot of sunshine, hardly rains. It's your natural solar energy capital of India. Right now, what Israel is doing with that small land area, Kutch can do 10 times over. And we can become a more powerful economy than Israel. Kutch can become more powerful than Israel. You go to Congo, we heard about Tirupur and all in the morning. And... Uh, the garment and textile industry in Coimbatore and Tirupur, this Congo area, they are all world leaders and world beaters. You empower Congo in the form of a small state and allow them free run to develop that. They will beat Bangladesh in the textiles. So you see what I'm getting at. We have 75 economic powerhouses. Then we can really take on the whole world. We can even take on China, let me tell you. I have no doubt. But we need a proper system, you know. It's no point you, me, talking, Rishi, who doing all these things. We need the facilitation from the state. The state 
and the state, and that's what I said, that I never viewed this constitution as a holy book, sacred book, nothing. It's written by ordinary people. All of us sitting together, we could have written a constitution. It's just some common sense, that's all. What do you want, what do you don't want? You don't need some, you know, great fellows. Those people and all, they are not God, God-like characters. We tend to make them into gods, worship them. See, this bhakti tradition that we have in India, Ambedkar warned about this bhakti thing in the debates. He said it is ruinous in any political system. But he says in India, where this bhakti cult is more strong than other places, it can probably be disastrous. And I think we are paying the price of this bhakti in matters of governance, economy and all this kind of thing. Slowly we seem to be coming out of that. When PM says, don't give me garlands, that's why he's saying it. When PM says, don't touch my feet, I, that's why he's saying it, because he doesn't want this so-called bhakti cult. Bhakti cult cannot get you into the modern world, sorry. And again, it's, it's a rather long answer, but this is why I put these 75 states, and why not 750? 750 was said by a very great man, Gandhi. He wanted 750. And I've also argued why you can take his solution, but his main idea I've taken that you need decent, more decentralization than what you have now. 28 is way too small. It is Actually, today I'll tell you, what this model of mine will give a strong, strong thing between central government and state governments. The states will become financially strong, the center will become politically strong. We do not want politically strong states. That has been the bane of India. Tamil Nadu, West Bengal, Maharashtra are examples of states that have become rogue states because they are too big. And they have very, very weird ideas in all these three states about where we are going as a nation and as a civilization. Short-term political interests in these three states, these are the three metropolitan cities of the British time. What a good job the British people did, that these are our three problem states today in India. Just think about it. I grew up in Bombay myself. And I've seen what I thought was a great city becoming some sort of a, I don't know. how. To, I travel to Calcutta very often, almost once a month. I think I know Bengal, and I've traveled all over Bengal. I think I know that place quite well. Why did all these things become like the way they've become? I tell you it's because the states have become too strong politically. The states have to become economically strong. Then they can start giving jobs, wages, they can take care of health, police, all the things that states are supposed to do. The center cannot have the state sniping. Half the time in Punjab they are worried whether they belong to that side or this side. Some Khalistan, some fellow being shot, some pop star was killed. And you know, you can't have afford things like that in a border state. And so I've also advocated, incidentally, the very last thing I want to say, since we're running out of time, is that the 75 states only make sense if we separate the legislature and the executive completely. So the so-called Westminster system of parliamentary democracy is, I believe, a travesty. Because it is only suited to UK, the one country in the world that has an unwritten constitution. All the other countries in the world have written constitutions. So our issues are different from UK. So to choose UK as a constitutional model was again, I believe, a height of folly. Especially considering the fact that Ambedkar liked the US constitution so much. That is clear in the debates. And I think it is the US model to which we should go when we have an elected president who brings his or her own cabinet as ministers and then you have an elective, elected legislature which makes all the laws. Because right now when you have legislature executive overlap, ministers and the prime minister become too powerful. And this is not good for us in the long run. And I think the US has shown, you know, its short constitution has been amended only 27 times in 250 years. Ours is the longest constitution in the world, longest. It has been already amended 104 times. I think I rest my case there.
Thank you uh, for that. Yeah, so we'll take um, maybe one question from the audience given the paucity of time we have. Um, okay, I'll just say one last thing. Sure. Sales pitch. Yeah, there yeah. are some copies of this book outside. I think my publisher has brought some. Yeah. So anybody who buys a book from him and shows it to me, I'll sign it for you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, any questions from the audience? Okay, we have uh, Professor Bhaskar, and he's also from the Hyderabad Central University. <laughs> so you, that way, your uh, colleagues, yeah. Uh, so, uh, sir, myself Bhaskar, Dr. Bhaskar Impelli from. Uh, so, yeah, it's a uh, really like uh, I really wanted to read the book. The like unless we read, it's uh, uh, difficult to comment on that. But I have two three. Uh, uh, issues like the doubts. One is that um, so it is said in uh, in social science books uh, it is said that almost 75 percent of the constitution has taken from the 1911 and the 1935 constitution, which is uh, made by British. Uh, how much that was true? Like how did you find that? And one more thing is that. I was, uh, for a short period, I was teaching Indian political thought for the political science students in uh, in my previous university. Uh, so I, I find most of the freedom fighters, M. N. Roy, Subhash Chandra Bose, uh, Bhagat Singh. So uh, everyone has, like, at the time of uh, the Second World War, after, especially after the Second World War started, so they have uh, felt the uh, the need of a station, and they have like, very vibrant thoughts. Like mm. everyone has, like mm. everyone has written so much on, mm. Mm. like how to uh, administer, how to uh, uh, develop India. So everyone has uh, mm. these kinds of thoughts. So I never seen, uh, like, uh, I have never found. Uh, uh, the after independent uh, political uh, uh, administration or the constitution debates taking these thoughts into consideration mm. so mm. have you uh, touched upon mm. uh, some uh, some mm. of these thoughts mm. so yeah mm. thank, thank you, you. Uh, both points you have mentioned have been covered extensively in my book this whole business about cut and paste now do I have one minute to answer? I don't want to inf cut into the time of the next presentation. Uh, first thing is that uh, Ambedkar said that the resemblance to the 1935 Government of India Act had mostly to do with the operation of the executive wing. And that may be true because the common complaint about the IAS officers today is that they still behave like colonial masters, that they are sitting on top of their hill in Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy in Mussoorie, ruling all the natives who are at the ground level. Let's face it, that kind of an attitude may be there, among some of them at least. It's what Ambedkar said. I have taken the line that if the constitution is able to address three what I call fault lines in our country, Hindu-Muslim fault line, upper caste, lower caste fault line, and center state fault line. If it has been able to address these three fault lines suitably, because all these fault lines are specific to us, they are not specific to any other country, then it is not cut and paste. And the cautious verdict that I give is that there has been partial success in all these three. It's not been a complete flop, but it's not been a complete success either. So maybe I'll just play with words and say it's partly a cut and paste constitution. So that is the first point. Second, I'm so glad you mentioned the name of M. N. Roy. Because M. N. Roy, in his 1944 constitution, gave a radically different interpretation of what a constitution should look like. Also, the so-called Gandhian constitution of 1946, which was radically different. I think the constituent assembly time, they did consider all these things and decided it was better to go into the Anglosphere. And I have written in the book also that considering the times and considering the fact that partition had happened, I think that Anglosphere decision was probably okay, it was correct. But that doesn't mean that the constitution is like some 
Hammurabi thing, you know, something etched in stone that we've got to go on worshipping and all that. It is not a holy book that fell to us from the sky. It is not Moses going up the hill and bringing Ten Commandments and saying, that's right, you guys better follow all this forever. Aristotle himself has said, that constitution is the best for a country that suits it at that particular time. And I feel that that 1950 constitution certainly does not suit us for this particular time. So that is why I am asking for a constituent assembly where Chandrachud cannot come and poke his finger. So no judicial interference in this constituent assembly. It will become a sovereign body of its own to write a new game plan for Bharat. Thank you. Thank you for that. As a parting note, um, um, would you have any message? Because uh, when I uh, read the book as well, you say, when India is 100 years in 2047, you don't want to see an India, you want to see a Bharat. Correct. So what would be your message? And because the young students here would you, be the ones building that. So You are the Bharatiyas. You make it possible. We have committed enough mistakes. At least our generation, we have guilty of sins of omission if not necessarily sins of commission. I don't think we have committed so many sins of commission, but we have committed plenty of sins of omission by not speaking up enough, not speaking up loudly enough, and not speaking up clearly enough. For this, you can go back to the Vedas. Some of the oldest portions of the Rig Veda, this whole idea of Vad and Samvad, which has come to us. You can have differences with anybody. Try to see the common points those common points will be very strong. You bring through those common points, come to a position where there is more or less unanimity. I have quoted that particular thing there in the book. So you are part of this experiment. What Modi ji said, what we should see in 2047, by 2047 we should be a 40 trillion economy. That is not going to happen unless you give this extra civilizational Philip. Because all the good things that the finance ministry is doing today, at best, in my opinion, will just give a linear growth. Finally, it may even plateau. But we are not playing to our strongest strength, that is diversity, dharma. So if you get a new constitution, not amendments. Amendments is like putting Band-Aid for a cancer. You know, that's not going to work. So a new constitution is needed, which will emphasize diversity, emphasize dharma, then we will get to whatever vision Honorable Prime Minister has told us for 2047. Otherwise, I fear we are not going to get there. And it will be just more of the same thing, adjust Karobhai, etc., etc., which has not taken us very far. The best that adjust Karobhai can give, do for you is Jugad. We can't do anything more than that. So please don't listen to any nonsense like yesterday, Raghuram Rajan saying that India should not go in for manufacturing because the world can't afford it. Well, the world was certainly able to afford us when they took 30 trillion from us. So the world is nobody to tell us to do this or that or don't do anything. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you for that. So diversity and dharma, that's the message that we should all carry. That's, if we imbibe that, then we can definitely build Bharat of what all the different thought leaders and freedom fighters all the way up to now the political leaders imagine India to be. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. And as Dr. Desi Raju has said, uh, his books are available for sale outside. Not very often you get a signed copy from a very eminent scientist. So this is your opportunity to do so. Thank you.